and we very, very much appreciate you all taking the time, whether it be morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, this is being recorded, so um, we'll have the opportunity, if you so desire, to uh, get you a recording of this afterwards to uh, review any of the material that we go over. Um, what to expect today? We uh, uh, First off, we're going to talk a little bit about Iris, but we're really going to hear from the stars of the show, and that are those are the folks from Community Health of Northwest Florida. We are very grateful. They've been a partner with Iris for, for quite a while, a number of years now, and they've um, uh, allowed us to, to tap into some of their knowledge and experience to share with all of you. So I um, want to thank you very much. A little bit of housekeeping as we get rolling. If you move your mouse around, you'll see a little menu bar pop up across the bottom of the screen, and you'll see a little uh, Q&A box there. If you have some questions during the presentation, uh, feel free to go ahead and type them in there. Uh, we, we have some folks that are able to address those as they come in. Uh, if we feel it's appropriate, we may address it in the, in the presentation if it's in the flow of what we're discussing. One way or another, whether it's during the presentation today or whether we get back to you afterwards, we will address all questions 100% absolutely. So um, feel free to ask those questions. We will um, uh, take a few moments to kind of have some discussion uh, on a few of the slides as we go through. So anyway, hopefully uh, that's enough of the introductions. Again, we thank you very much for taking the time. And Casey, why don't we go ahead and uh, look at the slide that uh, tells us who we're, who we're going to be meeting with today. So um, as I mentioned, uh, our partners from Community Health of Northwest Florida uh, I'm going to let Chandra and Dr. Charbonneau introduce themselves, and then I'll, uh, we'll, we'll get going from there. So, Chandra, why don't you kick us off? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Chandra Smiley, and I'm the CEO of Community Health Northwest Florida. I was thinking um, earlier this morning, Tom, that I have been with this organization in January. It will be 15 years. And as of November, I'll mark my seven years as being the CEO. So time has certainly flown by rather quickly, but I am so blessed and honored to serve this mission and work with such a great group of folks. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to share a little bit today with all of you about uh, some of the partnerships that we've been able to do with Iris. So thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Dr. Charbonneau? Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Mary Charbonneau. I'm an optometrist and I've been with Community Health uh, since 2016. I was uh, recruited by our medical director, Dr. Smith, as, as a candidate for meeting a very strong need here in our community here in Pensacola, Florida. Um, we, the IRIS relationship started before I got here and uh, the camera arrived before I got here, but I've had the privilege of using the camera to uh, screen and monitor patients for several years now, and um, it's been a very useful tool. So I'm happy to share my experiences today. Fantastic, thank you so much. And we are uh, fortunate Dr. Charbonneau chose a, a good position to be in uh, over her, her left shoulder there is one of the, the cameras that uh, can be utilized that they utilize for the iris images, but we'll talk about a little bit more about that as we get into it. Uh, my name is Tom Foster. Some of you may have seen on the invite uh, that there was going to be a gentleman named Lewis Morrow who would be presenting today, our vice president of sales. Um, as uh, life happens, there was a, a little bit of uh, flight trouble. So I am stepping in to, to help moderate and kind of move things along today. So I am a sales director. Typically, my area, I work in the Midwest, and then I handle some major accounts out on the West Coast as well. Uh, but we have sales directors all across the country to be able to focus and be able to address uh, concerns, questions, um, uh, curiosities about IRIS and our services. So uh, with that, why don't we jump into it a little bit? And, you know, all of you are, are on the phone today because in one way or another, uh, you understand that there's a, there's a problem going on. Um, uh, but sometimes I, we think that it helps to really have a better understanding of what we're up against in trying to um, combat diabetic retinopathy. So the numbers on this slide I find fascinating in some ways, and I find a little bit terrifying in others. So, you, you know, you see the raw numbers there, 34 million, you know, folks have diabetes, 14 million with diabetic retinopathy. 
but that little asterisk under there, uh, I think that's the real concerning nature of this is that this is not a problem that's going away. It's only getting worse. Um, the, 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 the problem that, that exists among those folks and, and why a company like Iris exists is because our data working with our clients and prospects across the country tell us that only about 40% of those folks are getting an annual eye exam. There are various reasons for that. And we all probably know them, right? That, that there's a, uh, it's extra time out of their day. It's somebody needs to give them a ride. There's full dilation and people are busy and it's, and it's difficult to, to allow that to happen. And the problem with diabetic retinopathy is you might not know what's going on until quite frankly, it's a little bit too late. So the, 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 the concerning numbers, uh, you know, again, in the upper right, that over 40% of the folks with, with diabetes have diabetic retinopathy. And if you take a look at that 34 million number, that means, you know, roughly 14, 15 million people in this country have diabetic retinopathy. The problem is, is that not nearly enough of them know it and that not nearly enough of them are getting treated and getting the correct interventions to halt that disease in its progression. And they are continuing to march towards blindness and they don't even know it. And so that's why we exist. That's why our partners that we work with across the country, folks like Community Health exist. Uh, for a variety of, of things that they're treating their patients for, but we certainly are concerned with trying to end preventable blindness. Diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness, not just in diabetics, but all across all U.S. adults. And that is, is extremely concerning, especially given the fact that if this disease is detected, there is a, a very, very high likelihood, 95% opportunity to at minimum halt it in its progression and prevent that, that pathology from progressing all the way towards blindness. And so if we can find these folks, if we can diagnose these folks, we can make a, a difference in their lives uh, that will be have tremendous impact. So, so, um, so that's the problem. And that, that's why we exist. And let's, let's now take a look at kind of very briefly what IRIS does to try and address that problem to help our partners across the, the country address that problem. Casey, if we could go to the next slide. Um, what we really uh, try to position the, the IRIS program is, is you see there simple, simple five-step solution. We want our clients to be able to treat the diabetic retinal exam as if it were another vital, as they're, they, it's standard operating procedure that someone comes in, they step on a scale, you're taking their blood pressure, you're taking their temperature. We want the DRE to be in that same vein, something that's that easy, that's that vital for the diabetics that are coming into your clinic. And so this is a process that has been refined over a number of years. It's been refined over uh, 450 different organizations that we work with across the country uh, as we've gotten into this and we hear feedback and there are different care settings, whether it be in clinics or in, in people's homes. Uh, we have really tried to streamline this and make it as simple and easy to use and, and adopt a program as possible. And so it, it really starts, obviously, you need to capture those initial images. We're going to talk a little bit about hardware options specifically as we get into uh, the presentation in just a little bit. But for, suffice it to say for the time being that obviously there's a piece of equipment that's necessary that we will teach you how to use in terms of approaching a patient in your clinic and capturing those images. We'll talk a little bit more detail about that in a moment. Once those images are captured, they obviously then have to be pushed up to to uh, our, our cloud, uh, our uh, secure cloud. And depending on the piece of hardware, typically that is literally as easy as pressing a button that says send. And those images then go up to the cloud and then the, those images go through a process and we're gonna take a look specifically at an example of this enhancement. Um, this all happens automatically once that button hits send. The images go up to the cloud and they go through this enhancement process that is proprietary to Iris. It is specific only uh, a benefit that our customers get. And, it, and what we do is we take those images and we put them through some color filters and some processing and an algorithm that illuminates 
the, 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 the very smallest of vasculature that's available uh, uh, based on that image that was taken. And that allows really for step four to happen that much easier, which is the diagnosis. And that diagnosis happens from a group of individuals that we have across the country uh, that are part of what we call our iris reading center. So when they, the images go up to the cloud, they go through this enhancement, they'll then fall into the queue of the person that's assigned to that particular account. And they will then have the tools in our platform available to them to be able to look at those images, to be able to blow them up, move them around, do whatever they need to do to really get a, 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 a clear view of what's going on with that patient. Um, and then be able to easily with, the, with a few clicks of, of their mouse, be able to create a report that is then pushed directly back down to uh, the provider, whomever that came from. And in that report comes not only ICD-10 codes, if there's a diabetic retinopathy uh, uh, diagnosis, uh, but our folks are also qualified, uh, obviously, if they see other things going on, cataracts, epiretinal, macular hole, other pathologies of the retina, they will indicate that on the report as well. <laughs> And then uh, uh, a set of, of suggested protocols on what should happen next. So depending on the severity of the diagnosis, um, uh, and, and by the way, our clients have the ability to customize what those instructions are that come back on that report. And then obviously it's communication with the patient, which happens at the, at the, uh, at the provider end. So it's, it's a, it, it took me much longer to explain that than it, than it really takes for that process to happen. Um, uh, it, 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 it takes typically about a day for us to get those results back the, from the time that you hit send and they go up to the cloud, go through the enhancement, they fall into the queue. Whenever those physicians have an opportunity to, to get into their queue uh, and look at those images, and then the system will create and push that report directly back down uh, to the provider. So again, we try to keep it as simple as possible. The work that needs to happen at the, at the, uh, at the clinic site um, it is, is capturing, pushing send, and then really just looking at that report when it comes back. We want this to be easy. We know it needs to be easy. We know that clinics are busy. And so that's where we've, uh, 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 the, the process kind of as it exists today. So that being said, that's a little bit about Iris, probably a little bit too much about Iris, but what we really want to focus our time on today is really the stars of the show, and that is um, uh, Chandra and, and Dr. Charbonneau to tell us a little bit about community health. Chandra already uh, uh, kind of highlighted the, the amount of time that, the, 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 that they have been partners with Iris, so I'll go ahead and let her talk a little bit about her organization, and we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you, Tom. Sure. Well, Community Health Northwest Florida, we have been a federally qualified health care center since 2008. Uh, we've been around in the Pensacola area since uh, 1992, so we're coming up on 30 years here in February. But we are located in the Panhandle, so we're, we serve as Scambia and Santa Rosa counties. So if you're not familiar with um, the panhandle of the different counties in Florida. We are the two farther western counties in the panhandle. Uh, as a federally qualified health center, our mission and our purpose is to take care of anyone who walks through our doors, regardless of payer status, insurance status. We exist because we believe everyone has the basic right to primary comprehensive health care services. And since becoming an FQHC, we have certainly been able to expand our service lines. Uh, right now, we are taking care of over 55,000 unduplicated patients who call Community Health their primary care home. We are seeing over 150,000 outpatient visits, and those visits include pediatric visits, primary care visits, dental visits, behavioral health and wellness, chiropractic, pharmacy, and care management services. But one of the first things I did, so I mentioned I, I was named the CEO back in 2014, and one of the very first partnerships and contracts that I signed was with Iris. And that was when we brought in the camera into our primary care service setting 
And going back to that five step um, process, it was, it was very easy. It was something that could be integrated into the primary care setting. But what it also did was it highlighted how important that it was for us to expand to a new service line and that was optometry services. And so Dr. Charbonneau hits the scene, you know, in 2016. And the program's at the point where it is literally bursting at its seams. We are looking at space and how we can uh, continue to serve and meet the needs of the folks that seek us out. But what you have in front of you is a, just a little bit of a snapshot of age group with our patients. I mean, about 48% of our patients uh, are 19 to 64. We do have a strong pediatric uh, population. Our pediatric um, program is pretty strong throughout our service area. But on the payer side, 56% of our patients have Medicaid or 22% have no insurance. So again, you know, we, we are here because there are individuals in our service area who have limited access to health care coverage or no health care coverage. So when you look at just those two payer classes, we're you know, over 78% either Medicaid or uninsured. Um, but contrary to popular belief, we do have Medicare patients and we do uh, contract with all of the payers. We have contracts with Blue Cross Blue Shields and Aetna's and, and United Healthcare. And again, to just make sure that we are available and accessible for anyone who seeks services at our organization. Yeah, fantastic, Sandra. That, that's uh, actually, we could just go back to that for a sec, Casey. I'm sorry. Um, you know, we're, we're going to talk a little bit uh, at the end because it, it always comes up in every conversation we have about IRIS with, with prospects that are thinking about engaging in a program like this is obviously there's the financial side of it. And we're, we're going to spend some time on that towards the end. But, you know, I, I the really interesting thing for us as folks that are trying to make this program work for as many patients as possible to get as many patients in front of a camera as possible is, is you know, this, this, this payer mix that, that I see on the screen here that you see, um, it's different everywhere we go. And we really encourage uh, all of our, our folks that are thinking about coming on board with Iris that, you know, really there's a, a real need to understand your individual situation as it relates to the diabetic retinal exam. And so, uh, there's, you know, depending on the payer mix, the contracts that you have, et cetera. And we'll talk a little bit more specifically about that uh, at the very end. But just, uh, yeah, that, that's really interesting that, that you've been able to continue to make this program work uh, to, and, and grow it uh, a, a, a couple of different times from what I understand over the uh, recent years, uh, even with, you know, that kind of a population mix. So I think that that's very exciting that you continue to, to strive towards that mission to, to bring it to healthcare, primary care to as many folks as possible. That's dynamite. Um, so now let's go on to that next slide, Casey, if we can. And so let's, uh, I wanna let Dr. Charbonneau talk a little bit about, you know, so this program has been in place as, as Shandra said for a number of years. So, you know, what is the impact? What, what kind of difference has it made in the community? And there's some numbers on the screen here that, that we wanted Dr. Charbonneau to kind of dive into a little bit deeper, if you would. Sure, thank you. Uh, we started, as I said, in 2016. Um, I was here just a couple days a week. Before I got here, we had a dedicated technician who would screen patients with the camera. And uh, we were recently recognized as having over, reached over 5,000 uh, exams. And um, initially, they were sending patients just to the tech from the primary care office. The patient was already there for an appointment and they encourage them, just go down the hall, it'll take a few minutes, go ahead and get your, your photo taken, um, and then come right back and, and we'll review that and get with you if there's any concerns. So it doesn't get much easier than that for you to go down the hall to get your retinal exam. Um, so they made it pretty easy. Now that was just one location, of course. So, um, and to get all, all of the uh, providers on board and everyone to know that the camera's there and where to go, um, so they got that up and rolling a few months before I got here, <clears throat> and then they were able to set up where I could do full eye exams. So the patients that are coming back with pathology, you can see in the second block there, um, over 2,000 patients. So, you know, that's a pretty high, high number. Where do these patients go once they are told, okay, you've got a problem? Um, 
a lot of them don't have an eye doctor. Some of them have never had an eye exam. Uh, so if they're limited on, on being able to pay for it, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of options here in town. Um, we did go through the, the Lions Club with assistance at some point and tried to get in with some of the retina specialists if needed. <clears throat> um, so the initial goal, I think, was for diabetic patients, but we don't just catch diabetes um, in the eyes. We catch other things. So these are patients that maybe needed a, a just a routine eye exam, and some of them needed a retina specialist. So that's kind of where I step in um, to to look at the photos. I'm able to actually go to the dashboard, go to the queue right there where the patient is, is here in, in the exam room, and go over the photo with them and tell them, okay, what, what are we seeing? What do we need to do next? Um, it's really easy to read them on the dashboard. And um, uh, the great ability, as you can see, the percentage, 96%, that's pretty high. Um, you know, there are different things from patients that will make them difficult to read, especially if they're very small pupils or if they have dense cataracts that are hard to see through. It makes it a little bit harder. <clears throat> but most of the time, the camera gets a good quality photo, and we can make something out and, and determine where they're at. It's, it's dynamite. Yeah. And that, that gradable rate, uh, it, it's interesting to know for, for those of you that may have looked into a program like this before, you know, there's, there's really kind of two different camera types. And again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about equipment in a moment, you, you know, over the, I said, Dr. Charbonneau's left shoulder there, you see there's a, that's what's called a tabletop. So it's a, uh, uh, obviously a unit that sits on a table, but but it's it's really directed to you know the patient kind of puts their 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 chin in the in the chin rest, their forehead against the forehead rest, and the camera you know does some of the work to to line up and capture those images. There's also cameras called handhelds, and uh, they are think about the size and shape of a of a hair dryer, and there Dr. Charbonneau is holding one up. Um, and so the, what's interesting is that that gradable rate is, quite frankly, regardless of camera type. So they have the ultimate uh, or the, the, the ideal conditions there in the clinic, but sometimes they are out in the field or out at remote clinics, which they'll talk about in a moment. They're still able to capture good exams. A uh, couple of different things. We, we believe partly is the training that, that we deliver and the attention that we continue to to, to put towards the partnership that we have with our clients. But, but uh, secondly, it's, it's that, that enhancement algorithm that we talked about that continue to make those images uh, easy to, easier to read. Um, one thing before we jump off of this slide that I, I wanted to, to mention, you see the little box there in the bottom where it says reports, create, edit, and export all data sets. So this data that Dr. Charbonneau was reviewing is available to the folks at Community Health 24-7. So they uh, are able to get real-time information. They can look at the last five days, the last 30 days, whatever. If they want to look at just one or two of their multiple sites and kind of zero in and look and see, hey, you know, there might be some uh, education issues needed here, or or why does volume seem to be dropping there, or whatever they do to need to look at to manage their business side of things, uh, they've got access to that information. And as all of our clients do, obviously, they have the ability to pull that data down into a CSV and manipulate it however they want, push it into a, a, a report tool if, if that's the desire. But we uh, allow access not just these five fields, obviously. There's uh, detail based on uh, what the diagnoses are, um, uh, how many patients qualify for uh, risk adjustment, for are RAP eligible for risk in, in those types of contracts, et cetera. So they've got access to a variety of, of data as it comes to it. The other thing I wanted to point out on this slide, and, and Dr. Sharp, I might have you, you, you pipe in on this again, is is that iris saves number. It's an incredibly uh, important number to us. We feel it's incredibly important to our clients and especially for those patients that, that we've identified in iris save. Iris save uh, is, is something that we define as someone who we've identified their pathology has progressed to such a point that you know, that, that really blindness or, or severe vision impairment is almost imminent. And without almost immediate 
uh, uh, interaction uh, or intervention rather, uh, uh, there's going to be a dramatic change in the quality of life of that individual. And so uh, when we're able to, to find those folks, um, uh, it, it's, it's incredibly powerful. And, and I see you've, you've broken the, the, the thousand mark and that I just, I just find incredibly impressive. And Dr. Charbonneau, when, you know, are, are you the one that typically then delivers this information back to the patient or is it uh, the, their primary care physician and then you're answering those questions after? Tell us about kind of that interaction with the patient when you've been able to tell them that, hey, we've got an opportunity to, to, to change the course of, of this disease. Right, yes, those are pretty dramatic sometimes. Uh, we have patients that, that have no idea and we are able to catch you know, impending uh, possible irreversible bl uh, blindness or vision loss. And these are patients that need treatment. They need to be sent right away over to a specialist and either need surgery or possibly injections into the retina to try to save their vision. And, um, you know, that's the difficult part of my job. I'm primarily the one who does give them the news. Um, and I do share the data with their primary doctor, whoever ordered the, uh, the photo, and let them know, you know, I'm sending this patient over. We caught yeah. something. So it can be pretty dramatic. Uh, you know, tears are shed sometimes here in, in the exam room. And um, I have to, you know, hold their hand a little bit and let them know what to expect. You know, sometimes if, we're, if we catch it in time, they, they can improve the vision. Sometimes they can't. But, um, you know, they, they may have not taken it seriously until now, and now they are. You know, it can be can be difficult. So it's it's good to be able to to have something to show them. You know, to um, prove. You know, there is something going on. We got to do something now. You know. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. We 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 hear those types of stories from from many of our clients about the the importance of making a difference in people's lives. So um, let let's move on uh, past. We want to. We told you that we would talk about the equipment that we talk about the cameras a little bit. And here we are, um, promise fulfilled. Um, so before I let uh, Chandra talk a little bit more about uh, equipment and, and what specifically community health does, um, want to make sure that everybody that, that's listening in understands that Iris, we are not a camera manufacturer. Uh, typically, what we do is well, not typically, we work with a variety of different manufacturers and we talk with our prospects and we talk with our clients about what makes the most sense for them. So instead of us having um, uh, the hammer and everything looks like a nail, so you know we have a camera and we're going to put it in every situation, whether that is applicable for our client or not, that's not the way we operate. We uh, want to provide options, whether it be different types of tabletops or whether it be different types of handhelds. We work with a variety of manufacturers. What Iris focuses on is the program that we're putting in place, is enabling our clients to, to set up and maintain a highly utilized, highly effective diabetic retinal exam program uh, through education, through the enhancement of, of the images through access to our eye care professionals, through the, the, the returning of the report and, and, and the ongoing partnership that we have with our clients long after the contract is signed, long after the training is done, long after we've taught them which button presses go and which one presses send. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. So just want to make sure everybody understands that Iris focuses on that program. We don't manufacture cameras, but we're going to work with you to find the best. We don't have a vested interest in one camera over another. We want to offer you a variety of choices and make sure that you get the, the, the best for your organization. So that being said, Chandra, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey in terms of that equipment and what you guys have where you guys have landed now? So we have a mix. We have a mix of uh, handheld and tabletop cameras. We started with the tabletop camera because at the beginning we were in integrating it into the primary care setting. 
But we, um, as I said earlier, our service area is Escambia and Santa Rosa County. And throughout the two counties, we have 17 service locations. And when we look at our patient demographic, diabetes is one of the top five. So from a programmatic perspective, it's how can we ensure that there is access and accessibility to this necessary scan for our diabetic patient th patients throughout our service area. So going with a handheld certainly gives us a lot of flexibility in taking that out. Um, as we look at some of our clinics throughout the service area, uh, it's looking at what diabetic patients are assigned to that clinic, reaching out, offering the scan, scheduling, getting, getting the staff at the locations. But also we do a lot of community outreach and education. Um, one of the things that we've done with Iris a lot is we've gone to gallery nights you know, on Palafox, which is downtown. They close the main streets. Artists bring their, um, their items out for sale and show. And we've been there uh, partnering just to raise awareness and have the handheld available to just kind of pull people in and do some education as they're walking by. We've also, uh, we have a homeless program uh, that we support through community health. We have a clinic at one of the local shelters in town, but we also go out and support our homeless providers. And we've been able to take the, the handheld out to offer the scan to our homeless patients and population. Yeah, that 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 flexibility, obviously, that the the handheld provides, um, um, is used in a variety of different ways. You said about going out to the homeless population. We have some clients that that take it right into to people's homes, uh, folks that are unable to get to their to their providers, um, uh, and on, and then obviously folks that, as you are moving it from clinic to clinic. Um, I heard a, a, a story and I went just, I guess either one of you can kind of share it, but, but when you all first started and you were using that, that, that big unit behind uh, Dr. Charbonneau that says DRS on it, um, uh, but you wanted to try to provide access to a wider audience, what, what did you guys do with that big camera? <laughs> we would travel with it. <laughs> uh, we would have one of the big strong guys here uh, loaded up into one of the, the trucks and take it uh, to a couple different sites uh, not far from here, about 20 minutes drive and set it up for us. But um, it, it comes on a table that goes up and down. So the table itself is a little bulky. And then the camera, you know, and you, you have to be careful traveling with it so it doesn't get broken or knocked or anything. So. It was a little bit of a, an effort, team effort, to get it to where we wanted it to be. So we would uh, choose a day, one day a month uh, for certain locations and, and just coordinate to get it set up there. And just everybody would send everybody that day to try to get as many as we could on that one day at that location. And, and it, it, had, it worked for us, but it was an effort. <laughs> that, that is dedication. That is dedication to the community and, and to getting that information out there. And uh, uh, certainly much better to have that handheld. You just pop it into that briefcase and easy to go now, right? Yes, there's a, a cell phone attached. It's an iPhone. So, I mean, if we forget the charger here in the office, most people have an iPhone charger we can borrow. <laughs> um, it's pretty easy to use. And um, it has a little soft cushion here where you can put it right up against the patient's face. And you just line it up and get the light just right and click the photo and then go to the other eye, click the photo. And that's it. You can be sitting in a wheelchair. You can be anywhere, and, and it's yeah. easy to go. That's dynamite. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, just to remind everybody that that's one particular option that's that's available. That happens to be from a company called Remedio. Uh, we work with other companies, Optimed, and others. So, uh, again, hopefully, we have an opportunity to speak with those of you that may be interested in exploring this a little bit deeper. Uh, we're happy to talk about all those different options. So, so let's let's now kind of transition. So, we 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 understand that there's. Uh, some tabletops in, in your, your arsenal. There's some handhelds. Um, how then, no, nope, I think we went one too far. So how then does that, let, let's talk about, and, and maybe some of this was, was kind of prefaced on, on what you just said, Chandra. And actually there's a, there's a picture there. You see there the, uh, the Pensacola Festival right in the middle. That's mm -hmm. one of the, I assume the uh, uh, outdoor fairs that that you were talking about uh, mm -hmm. just a moment ago, but I think that was uh, gallery night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> gallery night. Yeah, dynamite, dynamite. Yeah, yeah, bringing it out to the community. So, 
Um, so do, do, do one of you want to speak to a few of the points on, on this slide at all in terms of how having those different cameras enables kind of a, a, the workflow to happen within the clinics and outside? Yes, it, it, uh, it's pretty easy here in the main site, the clinic with the tabletop. Um, we have a dedicated room for it. Um, it's right in the middle of everything. So it's easy to access from, we have three pods for primary care on the same exact floor. So if somebody wants to be sent over immediately, we, we have staff here five days a week and we can send them over, do the photo in just a few minutes and then send them right back over to their primary doctor. So the workflow is, is pretty easy where we're located here at the main office. Um, and then of course the need for all our other locations um, when they're not, the patients aren't sitting here or they live further away. Um, you know, ideally I'd love to have one of these at every office, but um, I don't know if that's necessarily realistic uh, right now, but <clears throat> to be able to go bring the camera to where it's needed, um, maybe some all our satellite locations and schedule certain days uh, when it's easy to get patients in and get, and get the photographs done. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Dr. Sean Charbonneau mentioned about, you know, having the DRLs elsewhere. You know, obviously with the difference in across these cameras, there's financial differences in terms of how much they are, their flexibility, their mobility, uh, how they connect, et cetera. Uh, and that's one of those things that your IRIS rep will be able to talk to you about and kind of uncover what makes the most sense for your organization from a variety of, of, of different standpoints. So, and then we, we talked about the kind of the flexibility of, of the handheld cameras. So, um, uh, let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to remind everybody as we really kind of approach the end here, there's just a couple more slides that we're going to talk about, but I do want to remind everybody that if there are some questions to hit that QA at the bottom, feel free. Uh, we'll take a look at those when we're done presenting. If we can address them right on the spot, great. If uh, it's something that uh, is best uh, uh, explained in more detail after the fact, we'll, we'll certainly get that information out as well. But just wanted to remind everybody that that's there. So I've mentioned a couple of times now about this enhancement technology, this, this um, um, uh, proprietary algorithm that Iris clients have access to. And here you see you know, a very stark example uh, of that. So that image on the left um, is, is you know, fairly typical of, of a lot of images that are captured. Uh, there's a little bit of darkness there on the left side, typically indicates you know, a little bit of a smaller pupil size or uh, you know, you know, maybe just not quite zeroed in far enough with the camera, et cetera. There's a variety of reasons that that can happen, but, but that's, that's, that's relatively typical. And uh, you can see uh, the, the optic nerve, you can see the macula, you can see the, the upper vasculature there, but you see that some of that lower vasculature is a little bit hidden by that shadow. Um, sometimes that's as, as good as you can get with a particular patient. Maybe droopy eyelids, they're, they're impatient, they have small pupils. There, there's, you all face you know, all different kinds of patients and challenges, I, I, I know. Uh, what we can do though is take that image and put it through that proprietary enhancement. And I'm not sure what your monitor looks like where, you're, where you are or, or how big your screen is, but that image on the right is after we push it through that, 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 that enhancement algorithm. And we, we, as I said, we manipulate the colors in such a way to allow uh, the graders to be able to see much more detail of that vasculature. And you see there, you know, uh, average uh, gradeability, you know, 92 to 95 percent. You saw the the real world numbers that Community Health put up earlier. Uh, that over the lifetime of of them being clients, it's it's up over 96 percent. So, it's a a really important part that if you're going to take the time to put this program in place to identify patients who require or or need or or should have this exam to explain it to them and ask them to go down the hall and your folks to take the time to sit in front of them and take those images and then to take the time to, to look at those reports as they come back to the practice and so forth, you want to ensure that uh, uh, every opportunity and, and everything has been done to make sure that that is a worthwhile effort. And you want that, that, that to, to, to hit home uh, more often than not. And sometimes 
folks just simply have too small of a pupil in it with a non-midriatic camera, meaning uh, uh, doesn't require dilation. In it with a non-midriatic image, sometimes small percentage of the people, you're just never going to, it's very, very difficult to get to 100%. But certainly our goal is to push our clients as close to that 100% to make all of those efforts worthwhile for as many patients as possible. And that was that, by the way, that last 5% doesn't mean that they're out in the woods. Uh, it just means that Dr. Charbonneau has a tougher job to say, look, we can't get this image on you. We're very, very sorry. We've tried our best, but you really, 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 really need to go see an eye care professional to make sure you get uh, that full dilation and you have an opportunity to get that exam. We want the number of folks that you have to have that conversation with to be as small as possible. And that's through everything that we do from the, the hardware manufacturers that we choose to work with and offer to our clients, to the education that we provide, to the ongoing um, um, partnerships that we have, to the refinement of this enhancement algorithm, et cetera. All of those things are geared towards making your efforts more worthwhile and, and making the program more beneficial for your patients. So, um, so with that being said, we are going to go on to the last slide. And I did also promise you earlier that we were going to talk a little bit about money. Um, we know that um, uh, you know, most folks, it's easy to, quite frankly, understand the problem that's out there with the diabetic population in this country. It is easy to get behind something that is going to help those folks. But at the same time, uh, you all have to look at it from a business perspective to some degree. And so um, uh, there, there needs to be some financial uh, uh, benefit there or at least financial justification to be able to, to, to move forward and provide this. So we wanted to certainly talk about that a little bit. Uh, and I'll, I'll let Chandra go ahead and talk about their experience. And then I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back home with um, some, some final comments, if you will. So Shandra, I'll let you take away on this. All right. Thank you, Tom. So for community health being a federally qualified health center, we are able to bill out Medicaid and Medicare services at an enhanced rate. And what that is, is um, based on our uncompensated care, our cost per medical visit, that rate is set each year. The purpose of an enhanced rate is so that we can take the additional dollars that we're able to bill for those services and put it into our charity care or uncompensated care programs. So just as a reminder, one of the earlier slides, about 22% of our patient base are people without health insurance coverage. So the ability to have an enhanced global rate creates the opportunity for us to offer the same level of services for our uninsured patients. Also, the Having the diabetic um, retinal scan available for our diabetic patients, it helps to close some of those care gaps that the managed care organizations look at in terms of incentive payouts or, or packages. So when we're able to close that metrics, it certainly adds to our score and our ability, our eligibility for incentive um, payouts. Additionally, um, we are able to incorporate the scan into a comprehensive medical visit. And when we do so, it is eligible for that enhanced rate of reimbursement or that larger uh, global rate that I was speaking of. But I would say probably, and in, in a, a good example, and this played out this last year, is positioning us in negotiating with payers. So in the Panhandle of Florida, Region 1 is the, four, is the four Western counties. And in Region 1 in Florida, a managed care organization was bought out. So when that company came in, it was an opportunity for us to sit down with a new payer, look at our contract, and negotiate. We wanted a capitated contract. Um, and we were able to show them that we are a true primary care home and that we have this large spectrum of services that are, are available for our patients. And with that in mind, we were able to negotiate an increased rate in our capitation to the tune of an additional $7 per member per month. 
And when you're looking at 15,000 members that are assigned to you, that additional um, enhancement in the capitation rate certainly improved our cash flow position and certainly helps to support all of the other programs, support programs or wraparound programs that we have to support our patient base. But I'd like to um, just close out this slide or kick it back to you, Tom, just by saying having the program embedded within our primary care home and service uh, site, I, my office is literally located down the hall from Dr. Charbonneau and her team. And I see our patients coming in each and every day. And the ROI on just the patients leaving happy, pleased, cared for. They're going out and they're sharing with their friends and family how they can go to this one location, see their physician, but also see their eye doctor, also get their medication and all of the other services that we provide. So being able to add that additional service to our spectrum of services has improved our patient satisfaction, has obviously played uh, well for us in quality and incentive payouts, and certainly just adds to our position when we sit down with these payers and negotiate our rates. That, that's, that's fantastic. That's so good to hear. We at Iris uh, wake up every day and, and think about literally ending preventable blindness and how do we expand this program and having a, a partner such as yourselves that uh, have found a way to make it work that uh, are, are really a, a great example of the benefit, as you say, of, of offering that whole package. And um, it's, it's, it's just dynamite. So one of the things that I wanted to you know, address is that I know that not everybody that may be on the line today or that may listen to this recording afterwards are part of an FQHC. Some folks were just interested in IRIS and the program. And certainly, you know, uh, this, their situation may be different. And I kind of addressed it earlier in the presentation that that we we really encourage all of the folks that that we're we're speaking with about potentially coming on board with the program, uh, you know, to consult with your own reimbursement folks. Everybody has a different situation. Their payer mix is different. The types of contracts that they belong to are different. Um, uh, their their government qualification classification is is different. And so generally uh, what we find is that there's a number of kind of different buckets where people find to various degrees, based, depending on what kind of, of, of provider you are and depending on what kind of contracts you're in, but there's really some different buckets that, that, that provide ROI. And by the way, this addresses, I believe, one of the, the, the questions that came in on the QA. Uh, not surprisingly, two of the, the, the three that I, I looked at so far had to do with the um, uh, with reimbursement. So we know that it's an, an important piece of the puzzle that needs to make sense in order to be able to provide this service to your patient. So anyway, so just, just in general, again, these may apply to different folks more or less than the, depending on your contracts, but, but generally, and sometimes there's kind of an upfront, we call it a fee for service reimbursement, uh, typically involves using a, a particular CPT code. There's a number that uh, different CPT codes that our clients use that that may apply depending on their interpretations of the codes. 92250 is one, 922227 is one. I think I used too many twos there. And 92228 is another. Um, but but again, depending on, on your environment, those may or, or may not work according to your interpretation. But typically there's a reimbursement up front for that service. Depending on which code you use, there are technical and professional components to those codes. So um, uh, we have some folks that that build a global and build both. Uh, two of those codes are only technical pieces, but we can get into those discussions individually in more detail. But one bucket is that fee for service reimbursement. Another area uh, is 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 in in general quality scores being improved. And and Chandra kind of mentioned this in her organization. Depending on whether you are judged by HEDIS scores uh, or, or other metrics, uh, NC, NCQA or whatever they are, um, certainly having a higher percentage of your diabetics, uh, having an annual eye exam uh, certainly improves your, your metrics and improves uh, the opportunity for 
whatever your arrangement is, whether it be bonuses or whether it be um, um, uh, excess financial benefit that comes back to your, your practice or, or your clinic or your organization based on having those higher quality metrics, obviously that's incredibly important. Another area is, is an area that I mentioned before, and that is in the area of uh, risk adjustment factor type contracts. So those contracts that reimburse uh, based on a, on a PMPM basis, and then based on the acuity of those patients, that PMPM number may rise or fall based on that acuity. Certainly identifying folks that are diabetic incre increases that PMPM. Identifying diabetics with eye pathology increases that PMPM even more. So really, it's a matter of being appropriately reimbursed for the care that you're delivering for your particular population. Um, another, uh, the last one I'll kind of talk about is, is the last big bucket um, is really in any of those contracts where you're assuming a great amount of risk uh, and are responsible for downstream costs. Obviously, as with almost any disease, the earlier that you can catch it, uh, hopefully the less invasive and the less expensive that treatment will be to either keep that, that pathology or that disease at bay or help to improve upon it. So if we can catch folks earlier, we're avoiding those downstream costs of catching that pathology later, uh, of them going potentially you know, uh, functionally blind. Um, that increases the cost of caring for that patient dramatically, obviously. So if we can avoid those costs, that's kind of another area where people look at in terms of reimbursement. Um, and then, and then the last that Sean Chandra mentioned was in, in, you know, having this as a service and being able to use that as a negotiating tool, uh, can be critically important. So a number of different areas, obviously you may have a specific, um, situation that we'd love to talk individually uh, about. Um, that being said, I'm going to take a quick peek at our questions here. And since we have just a couple of minutes here, if that's okay, Dr. Charbonneau and, and Chandra, um, I see here, uh, how is the cover, the cost cover going to the community? We talked a little bit about that. Chandra did specifically return on investment. Again, kind of depends on the specific situation uh, in terms of how big of a program you want to do, what kind of contracts you're in. Uh, your IRIS rep can certainly work with you individually and talk about that. Uh, I will tell you that we continue to grow and uh, clients don't continue to come on board and expand with us if the, generally this is a financial loser for them. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll let that be said and then we'll talk individually about your situation. Uh, billing the technical component. Again, everybody kind of handles that differently. Um, uh, some folks don't use those CPT codes at all and they rely completely on the increase in payments they'll get from having higher HEDIS scores, et cetera. Um, some folks do use those. So um, we encourage you again to work through your reimbursement folks to figure out what that reimbursement would be with the payers that you work with. And then we can help to, to you know, Put that that pricing together to help it make sense for your organization. Uh, and the last one that I see that's here, uh, we're not an FQHC, but our teaching facility that started using the desktop camera in April. That's dynamite. Eye specialist on site, trained staff to perform, successful with billing. Uh, I think that might be so. I, it's hard for us to open up the line to kind of take a survey of the folks that are on line. Um, uh, we, Sh Chandra talked a little bit about the success that they, success that they have had uh, in terms of financial. We will certainly uh, get back to you with more detailed answer on that particular question. We get a log obviously of all the questions that came in. So we certainly will reach back out. I think that that about covers it. Um, I, for one, would like to really thank Dr. Charbonneau and Chandra for uh, working with us to, to, it's not just today's one hour, but obviously there's some preparation that goes into a presentation like this. Um, they are busy. They are trying to carry out their mission in Northwest Florida, and we uh, are immensely appreciative of them taking the time to share their story uh, with us and with all of you. 
Uh, Chandra or Dr. Charbonneau, any closing thoughts or words before we sign off? Now, I just thank you, uh, Tom, for the opportunity for us to come and share with um, with some of your partners. It's again, it's been a great partnership, seven years strong, and we're looking forward to another seven. Thank you. Sounds great. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Iris has been really supportive, and uh, you guys have been fun to work with. You guys, you guys are good. <laughs> you help us out when we need it. We call and we need help, and you come, and it's great. Thank so you. if uh, we can help patients, we can make it financially viable and uh, have some fun along the way. That sounds like the best uh, of all worlds. So any, yeah. anyway, with that, we will sign off. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, keep an eye on your email. We pr try to do these once a quarter with different topics and different types of clients. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to join us again. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank